So we're getting ready for our trip to the States. Uh, we're gonna start the boat hunt for Atticus 2. We are flying out on Thursday, and today is Monday, so we've got, what, three days? Five weeks ago, I sent my passport off to get renewed, and they told us it would take two to three weeks, and here we are, like, you know, coming up on five, and still haven't gotten the passport back. I think we've emailed the embassy in Panama City six times with zero response, and we've called them, like, somewhere around 10 times, and we can never get anyone that can help us. I'm gonna give them a call again today. To continue in English, press one. If you have a question about consular services, press one. If your question is related to U.S. citizen services, press two. If your question is related to a U.S. passport, press one. For urgent travel, press three. Please send an email to panama-acs at state.gov. That's very cute. They just say to email the email address that is not responding. It did have an operator option in the menu, so I'm going to give that a go. So I think the next thing we should do, bud, is call the life-threatening hotline. Mm -hmm. The emergency line? Yeah. And make sure you say, first thing, that this is not life-threatening. If you're calling to report the death of a U.S. citizen, a missing U.S. citizen, or a hospitalized U.S. citizen, or a U.S. citizen victim of a violent crime, That's what I first two. No. Yeah. Your you did? Yeah. To a U.S. passport, consular report, <laughs> first abroad. Yeah. If your question is related... That's nuts, man. Yeah. What do they do? Like, if you can't even contact them to tell them that, like, you're <laughs> dying. <someone's> missing. <laughs> yeah, really. Jesus. Yeah, imagine if, like, you got kidnapped. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, well, I'll just tell the embassy because that's probably a gr gr great place to start. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no. Nah. <laughs> we don't really do that right now. <laughs> so messed up. Okay, so a friend of ours recommended that we try to contact our congressman's office to see if they can help us out in some way. Thank you for your call. It's an honor to serve you and our Florida families. Your call is important to me, so please leave a message and we'll be sure to return your call. Hello, good morning. Um, I am a uh, U.S. citizen, a, a Florida resident, um, and I'm traveling in Panama. Bud. It's going super good. Yeah. You know, we contacted Greg Stubbe, our congressman from Florida's 17th district. They got back to me like right away and he put his deputy district director Libby Bowles kind of on the case. What? It's only been a couple hours since I emailed them and she's contacted the embassy, got the embassy to like confirm with her that they have my passport at the embassy. Well, special thanks to Congressman Stubbe. We really, really appreciate your help. That's, that's incredible. I know. Thanks, Stubbe. Appreciate <laughs> it, man. Stubbe, dooby doo, dooby dooby doo. Vote, Vote for Stubbe. <laughs> what you working on there, bud? Well, taking the sunshade down for maybe the last time. Yeah, crazy. Weird, huh? Yeah. It's like what Atticus meant to us for so many years, you know? This way that we could maybe have this incredible experience even though we didn't have any money, you mm -hmm. know? Like, and it was like a dream. That's what it was, you know? Mm -hmm. Atticus was a dream. It's harder to say goodbye on deck because she's so pretty outside. I know. You know? She's like sparkling white. She like looks like a total piece of shit on the inside. <laughs> okay, bud, we about ready? Yeah, just closing up the windows and sealing her up. Yeah. It's so weird. You be good, Atticus. Got all our stuff here. Yeah. Got the Guatemalan cowboy hat. <laughs> yeah. Feels weird to be saying goodbye to this chapter of our lives, you know? So many memories and 
mistakes <laughs> and accomplishments too. Yeah, it's been a good home. Yeah. I feel like this chapter of our lives, like I think we'll remember it as the scariest, hardest, craziest chapter in our lives, you know? I think it's gonna really define who we are for the rest of our lives. And that and that's the chapter that we're Yeah. Kinda ending. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Atticus taught me that like nothing is easy and like Life is just full of challenges and you can never expect things to go your way. And you just have to deal with the uncertainty and the change and the stress in a way that you still wake up every morning and you feel like you can handle it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> okay. Yeah, it's getting hot. Let's get these bags out of here. And let's go home and find Atticus too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's do it, buddy. in the States and getting ready to begin our boat hunt for Atticus 2. So we thought it'd be a good time to sit down and kind of talk about what we're looking for in a boat for Atticus 2. Our values, our experience, our cruising style has formed a lens that we're gonna be looking at boats through. And so we kind of want to describe what that lens looks like. And so the first thing we want to talk about is the lessons that we've learned from our experience with Atticus. The first one is that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And that is just that when we first started looking for Atticus One, we were thinking that we were gonna find a really good deal. Like we were gonna find a boat that was real cheap, and if we just put a little bit of time and work into it, that we'd have a great boat and be able to save money by doing it that way. In our experience, that just was not the case. I don't think we saved any money <laughs> by buying a boat that was in really bad condition and then fixing it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that was mostly because we bought a boat that we needed to replace every single system on. So mm -hmm. we redid the plumbing, the electricity, mm -hmm. the rigging, new sails, new engine. New anchor, new anchor chain. Shoot, new water tanks. Uh huh. And so that costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. Yeah. Now we saved a lot of money by buying a really small boat. Mm -hmm. And that's a great idea, I think, you know, like save the money in the size, mm -hmm. but not necessarily in getting a boat in bad condition. Mm -hmm. Typically when people sell their boats, you're getting a 50% return on all the investments that you've put into the boat. So say you throw in a brand new water maker that's worth $4,000 and then sell the boat tomorrow you can only really add about $2,000 worth of value to the asking price of the boat. And so you're getting a better deal 
buying a boat that has functional systems, if that makes sense, rather than buying a boat that doesn't have functional systems and then you need to pay to put all new systems into the boat. And so if a boat is, you know, costs $5,000 and all the other boats like that on the market cost more like 20, you know, we've learned to be pretty uh, skeptical of that cost difference and assume that there's gonna be an actual difference in value because there's gonna be problems with the boat that the other ones don't have. So the next thing that we learned from Atticus is that older is not necessarily better. And so what I mean by that is when we first went looking for Atticus one, I was under the impression that older boats were built stronger and used more fiberglass. I mean, that's something you hear all the time when you talk to somebody who's got an older boat. They say, oh, the hull is this thick. I think that the art, the craft of building pleasure yachts, you know, boats that people are going to live aboard and adventure on, that craft of building those boats is not very old. And so there's been a tremendous amount of advancements in design, whether it be the hull shape, the keel design, the overall like structure of the boat, or whether it be designing the systems and how they work and how life on board can be more convenient. Newer boats are gonna really benefit from those advancements a lot. When we first bought Atticus, I was really into reading Lynn and Larry Party, and I felt like we were doing something similar to Lynn and Larry in that we, they cruised in the you know 60s, we had a boat built in the 60s, they cruise on a small boat, we had a small boat. But I, now, after years of fixing Atticus and, and working on her and dealing with age-related problems, I now realize that Lynn and Larry Party cruised on brand new boats. Now, they built them themselves, but it's still, the fact is that they cruise on brand new boats. And so the problems they were experiencing, the, the sorts of challenges they were experiencing were totally different from ours particularly from a how reliable they felt their boat was standpoint. They had full confidence in their boats because they knew how strong they were. And something that was a challenge from the beginning with Atticus is we didn't fully know how strong Atticus was. And so what we've learned, I think, is to focus on trying to find a boat in good shape and then sacrificing on the size of the boat uh, to meet your price point, basically. Mm -hmm. So with those lessons that we learned, um, we've been able to kind of put together our priorities or our values that we're going to be focusing on when we look for Atticus 2. Um, the first of which is that we want Atticus 2 to be a good home for a family of four, probably, for at least the next 10 years. So we're planning on having two kids and we want them to be able to grow up and not have the boat get too small for us, you know, in just like five years from now. And so with that in mind, we're looking at boats between 37 and 42 feet. That's right there in the range where you start to have enough room for kids, you start to have a separate sleeping area and just enough room where we wouldn't literally go insane. <laughs> we may actually go insane still. So we're gonna have to get on the boats and really try and get a sense of what we actually will need. We could borrow some kids, find some kids on the street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Throw them yeah. in the boat. Or just measure them. I've been trying to think like, we need to go find some like six year olds, eight year olds, get their like shoulder width measurements. Give them some candy. See how long they are. Would you say you kick much when you're asleep? <laughs> We could look at boats that are bigger than that because they would have more space for the kids and larger sleeping areas. But at the same price point, the larger the boat, the worse the condition it'll be in, most likely. Because if it's gonna be a bigger boat at the same price, then we're assuming with what we learned from Atticus that it'll be in worse shape. Um, and that leads us to our second priority with Atticus 2, which is we wanna spend more time sailing, more time adventuring, and less time working on the boat. And that means buying a boat that's in better condition. Living on Atticus really taught us that boat life equals work on boat life. Yeah. And we, we totally understand 100% that um, if you're going to live on your boat full time and sail around the world and really push it to its limits, you're going to be working on your boat a lot of the time. Yeah. The fact is, though, that people that we would meet while we were cruising that had newer boats or boats in better condition 
worked on their boat significantly less of the time than we did. And, and we saw it time and time again in different places. Um, we actually calculated it. In the last six years, we actively sailed, explored, adventured under 20% of our time of that last six years. And so we would like to make that percentage something more like 50%, right? So it's not that we are hoping to never work on the boat. It's not like we have these grandiose visions of not having to do that kind of stuff. We just want to do it less of the time. In general, we're looking for boats that have been made since 1990, ideally closer to around 2000 or the late 90s. Now, also on top of that, the boats that we're looking at have to have been designed to be maintained well. And what I mean by that is a lot of boats, especially nowadays, are kind of built to be sold, right? So they're built to be really attractive for like three years and then that's it. And the designers and the builders, they didn't really have longevity in mind. So they weren't thinking about, oh, okay, well, what's it gonna be like 30 years down the road? You know, are they gonna be able to remove the engine if they have to? Are chain plates easy to inspect? Are they glassed in? Are they easy to see or get to? Things like teak decks, right? Uh, boats that have teak decks, when they get to be 20, 30 years old, you can start to have problems with water leaking into the deck coring and stuff like that. And then finally, the last value that we have is we want a boat that prioritizes comfort at sea or while sailing offshore. Uh, passages offshore can be super miserable, right? The motion can be extreme. You can get seasick for days on end. You're sleep deprived. You're not really cooking good food sometimes. And we know that on Atticus 2, we're gonna be spending a lot of time doing long distance voyages. And so we wanna make sure that Atticus 2 is designed to kind of optimize to be offshore and to be relatively comfortable while sailing offshore. Um, a lot of boats are designed to be really comfortable at anchor. So you're talking about like really large, really nice interiors, um, but not so much thought put into the actual hull shape that will make for more enjoyable passages. And so we're looking specifically at boats that prioritize the hull shape, the design elements that will potentially make it a little bit smaller on the interior, but will make the boat more comfortable offshore. For Atticus 2, we're gonna be looking at fin keels with a skeg hung rudder, and that kind of gives it that good performance offshore with a good motion. You know, we do a lot of exploring poorly charted areas and running aground is always a possibility for us. So a skeg hung rudder with a relatively conservative fin keel that's well connected to the hull will make running aground a less detrimental experience. A lot of people have asked us, are we considering catamarans? And the short answer is not right now, uh, not for Atticus 2. If we want to accomplish these three priorities, we simply can't do that on a catamaran at our price point. And then people have been asking us about what kind of a rig we've been looking at. I'm looking to move to a cutter, particularly because it does the best job at our third priority, which is uh, to do well while sailing offshore. The cutter rig is gonna do better uh, windward performance than say the catch would, but because of that stay sail, we would be able to reduce sail to a really small amount quickly and easily uh, if winds pick up while we're offshore. So with those three priorities in mind, we've come up with a list of boats that are on the market currently that we're gonna go look at and consider. Um, we've got the Pacific Seacraft 37 and the 40, uh, Robin Hood 40, Valiant 42, Nyad 370, it might be Najad, I'm actually not sure how to say it, it's Swedish, Caliber 40, and the Tiana Vancouver 42. So we're gonna hop in our car and do a big boat hunt road trip up the East Coast and look at all of these boats and we're gonna be releasing a weekly video um, about each boat that we see uh, over the next couple of weeks. 
And the first boat that we're gonna look at this coming week is gonna be a Pacific Seacraft 37. So we're so excited to see it in person. I've seen all the sketches and pictures and drawings online and I wanna get in that boat and feel it. And to those of you who've contributed to our Kickstarter campaign, thank you so, so much. We are completely blown away by the love and support and encouragement that we've received. We cannot wait to find Atticus 2 and get out there and start sailing again. So happy holidays, um, happy new year, and we'll see you in 2021. All right, see you guys.